Greetings, my friends. How is everybody today? <clears throat> I'm hoping I can see the chat over here. Shall I say hello? Well, ah, there it goes. How is everyone? Um, I have to apologize for Friday. Um, I was going to do a live on Friday, but I was in the hospital. Um, I'm better. Um, it was an allergic reaction to some of the medicines that I was taking. So um, they kept me a couple of days. And um, I got home Saturday morning about noon, maybe 11. And um, I've been recuperating from being in the hospital since then. Um, today we are going to do um, the yearling chapter three. I was hoping that we were going to be um, farther along in the book by now, since it's already almost the middle of February, February, that's a hard word to say, but, um, since we are not, um, any farther along, we'll just keep on keeping on. I'm hoping to get, um, I'm doing live Monday and Friday. So those will be the chapters that fall on those days. And then um, I want to at least upload two or three chapters between Monday and Friday. So hoping to do five chapters a week. Um, but we'll see how my health holds out and that kind of thing. So um, here we are. I'm going to go ahead and get started on chapter three of the yearly yearling by Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. Oh, while I'm at it, thank you. Hello, hello, hello to all my new subscribers. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us here. So, The Yearling, Chapter 3. Jody opened his eyes unwillingly. Sometime, he thought, he would slip away into the woods and sleep from Friday until Monday. Daylight was showing through the east window of his small bedroom. He could not be certain whether it was the pale light that had awakened him or the stirring of the chickens in the peach trees. He heard them fluttering one by one from their roost in the branches. The daylight lay in orange streaks. The pines beyond the clearing were still black against it. Now, in April, the sun was rising earlier. It could not be very late. It was good to awaken by himself before his mother called him. He turned over luxuriously. The dry corn shucks of his mattress rustled under him. The Dominic rooster crowed boisterously under the window. You crow now, the boy said. See, can you rout me out? The bright streaks in the east thickened and blended. A golden flush spread as high as the pines, and as he watched, the sun itself lifted like a vast copper skillet being drawn to hang among the branches. A light wind stirred as though the growing light had pushed it out of the restless east. The sacking curtains eddied out into the room. The breeze reached the bed and brushed him with the cool softness of clean fur. He lay for a moment in torment between the luxury of his bed and the coming day. Then he was out of his nest and standing on the deerskin rug and his breeches were hanging handily and his shirt right side out by good fortune. And he was in them and dressed and there was not any need of sleep or anything but the day and the smell of hot cakes in the kitchen. Nothing better than to get yourself out of bed after you've had a good night's sleep and the alarm has not awakened you and... There's nothing better than sleep until you just wake up. Hey, old Ma, he said at the door. I like you, Ma. 
You and them hounds and all the rest of the stock, she said. Mighty loving on an empty belly and me with a dish in my hand. That's the way you're purtiest, he said and grinned. He went whistling to the water shelf and dripped into, dipped into the wooden bucket to fill the wash basin. He soused his hands and face in the water, deciding against the strong lye soap. He wet his hair and parted and smoothed it with his fingers. He, looked, he took down the small mirror from the wall and steadied himself a moment. I'm terrible ugly, Ma, he called. Well, there ain't been a purty Baxter since the name begun. He wrinkled his nose in the mirror. The gesture made the freckles across the bridge blend together. I wish I was dark like the foresters. You be proud you ain't. Them fellers is black as their hearts. You're a Baxter and all the Baxters is fair. You talk like I wasn't no kin to you. My folks runs to fairness too. They ain't none of them purty though. Puny though. If and you'll learn yourself to work, you'll be your pa all over. The mirror showed a small face with a high cheekbones. The face was freckled and pale, but healthy, like fine sand. The hair grieved him on occasions when he went to church or any doings in Volusia. It was straw-colored and shaggy, and no matter how carefully his father cut it, once a month on the Sunday morning nearest the full moon, it grew in tufts at the back. Drake's tails, his mother called him. His eyes were wide and blue. Then he frowned in close study over his reader, or watching something curious, they narrowed. Oh, when he frowned, in close study over his reader, or watching something curious, they narrowed. It was then that his mother claimed in kin. He do favor the Alverses a mite, she said. Jody turned the mirror to inspect his ears. Not for cleanliness, but remembering the pain of the day when Lim Forrester had held his chin with one vast hand and pulled his ears with the other. Boy, your ears is set up on your head like a possum's, Lim said. Jody made a leering grimace at himself and returned the mirror to the wall. Do we got to wait for Pa to eat breakfast, he asked. We do. Set it all in front of you and there'd likely not be enough left for him. He hesitated at the back door. And don't you slip off neither. He ain't but to the corn crib. <clears throat> From the south beyond the blackjacks, he heard the bell-like voice of old Julia giving tongue in great excitement. He thought he heard, too, his father giving her a command. <clears throat> he bolted away before his mother sh sharp voice could stop him. She too had heard the dog. She followed to the door and called after him. Don't you and your pa be gone too long now following that fool hound. I'm a no mind to sit around waiting breakfast and you two piddling around in the woods. He could no longer hear either old Julia or his father. He was in a frenzy for fear the excitement was over. The intruder gone and perhaps dog and father with it. He crashed through the blackjacks in the direction from which the sounds had come. His father's voice spoke close at hand. Easy, son. What's done will wait for you. He stopped short. Old Julia stood trembling, not in fear, but in eagerness. His father stood looking down at the crushed and mangled carcass of Black Betsy. The brood sow. He must have heard me daring him, Penny said. Look careful, boy. See, do you see what I see? The sight of the mutilated sow sickened him. His father was looking beyond the dead animal. Old Julia had her sharp noise, nose turned in the same direction. Jody walked a few paces and examined the sand. The unmistakable tracks made his blood jump. They were the tracks of a giant bear. And from the print of the right front paw, as big as the crown of a hat, one toe was missing. Oh, Slowfoot! 
Penny nodded. I'm proud you remembered his track. They bent together and studied the signs and the direction in which they both come and gone. That's what I, what I call, Penny said, carrying the war into the enemy's camp. None of the dogs bait him, Pa, less than I didn't hear for sleeping. None of them bait him. He had the wind in his favor. Don't you think he didn't know what he was doing? Slipped in like a shadow and done his meanness and slipped out for a day. A chill ran along Jody's backbone. He could picture the shadow, big and black as a shed in motion, moving among the blackjacks and gathering in the tame and sleeping sow with one sweep of the great clawed paw. Then the white tusks followed into the backbone, crushing it and into the warm and palpitating flesh. Betsy had had no chance even to squeal for help. He'd already fed, Penny pointed out. He ain't no more than a mouthful. Bear's stomach has shrunk when he first comes out in his winter bed. That's why I hate a bear. A creature that kills and eats what he needs. Why, he's just like the rest of us making out the best he can. But an animal or a person either that'll do harm just to be a doing. You look in a bear's face and you'll see he's got no remorse. <clears throat> you aim to carry in old Betsy? The meat's bad tore up, but I reckon there's sausage left. And lard. Jody knew that he should feel badly about old Betsy. But all that he could feel was excitement. The unwarranted kill inside the sanctuary, the Baxter Acres, had made a personal enemy of the big bear that had evaded all the stock owners for five years. This was, he was wild to begin the hunt. He acknowledged to himself, as well as a trace of fear, old Slewfoot had struck close to home. He took one hind leg of the sow and Penny the other. They dragged it to the house with Julia reluctant at their heels. The old bear dog could not understand why they did not set out at once on the chase. I'll swear, Penny said, I'm destined to break the news to your ma. She'll rare for certain, Jody agreed. Betsy was such a fine brood sow. My, she was fine. Ma Baxter was waiting for them by the gate. I've been a-calling and I've been a-calling, she hailed him. What you got there piddling around so long? Oh, dear goodness. Oh, dear goodness, my sow. My sow. She threw her arms toward the sky. Penny and Jody passed through the gate and back of the house. She followed, wailing. We'll hang the meat to the cross piece, son, Penny said. The dogs will not reach it there. You might tell me, Ma Baxter said. The least you can do is tell me how come her dead and tore the ribbons right under my nose. Oh, Slewfit done it, Ma, Jody said. His tracks were certain. And them dogs asleep right here in the clearing? The three had already appeared, nosing about the fresh smell of the blood. She threw a stick in their direction. You no-count creatures horning in on our rations and leaving such as this to happen? Ain't a dog born as smart as that bear, Penny said. They could have barked. She threw another stick and the dog slunk away. The family went to the house. In the confusion, Jody went first into the kitchen where the smell of breakfast tortured him. His mother could not be too disturbed to notice what he was doing. You get right back there, she called, and wash your dirty hands. He joined his father at the water shelf. Breakfast was on the table. Ma Baxter sat, swaying her body in distress and did not eat. Jody heaped his plate. There were grits and gravy, hot cakes and buttermilk. Anyway, he said, we got meat to eat for a while now. She turned on him. Meat now and none this winter. I'll ask the foresters out of a sow, Penny said. Yes, and be beholden to them rascals, she began to wail again. That blasted bear, I'd like to get my hands on him. 
I'll tell him when I see him, Penny said mildly between my thoughts. Jody burst out laughing. That's right, she said. Make fun a fun box out in me. Jody patted her big arm. It just come to me, Ma, how you look. You and old Slewfoot mixing it. I bet your ma, I bet on your ma, Penny said. Nobody but me don't take life serious, she lamented. Okay, so now we know about old Slewfoot. So, Slewfoot is one nasty old bear. Been around for five years. Been tearing up the farmers and the ranchers animals and their crops and old Slewfoot is a major character in this story he's one of the side uh, stories to the yearling so I think we're going to go on to chapter four chapter four Penny pushed back his plate and stood up from the table well son we got our day's work laid out for us Jody's heart fell hoeing. We stand a right good chance of coming up with that bear today. The sun was bright again. Fetch me my shot bag and my powder horn and the tender horn. Jody jumped to bring them. Look at him move, his mother said. To see him hoe, you'd think he was a snail. Say hunting and he's quick as an otter. She went to the kitchen. <clears throat> she went to the kitchen safe and took out one of the few remaining glasses of jelly. She spread the jelly on the leftover stack of hotcakes and tied them in a piece of cloth and dropped them in Penny's knapsack. She took the remains of the sweet potato pone and set aside a piece for herself, then added the pone wrapped in a fragment of paper to the knapsack. She looked again at the pone she had saved and with a quick motion dropped it in the sack with the other. This ain't much dinner, she said. Maybe you'll be soon back. Don't look for us till you see us, Penny said. Anyways, no man never starved to death in a day. To hear Jody tell it, she said, he can starve to death in about an hour after breakfast. Penny swung the knapsack and tender horn over her shoulder. Jody, take the big knife and go cut a good strip off in that gator tail. The meat, dry cured for the feeding of the dogs, hung in the smokehouse. Jody ran to it and swung open the heavy timber door. The smokehouse was dark and cool, odorous with the smell of hams and bacons, dusty with the ash of hickory. The rafters studded with square-headed nails for the hanging of meats were now almost bare. Three shoulders of ham hung, lean and withered, and two bacon sides. A haunch of jerk venison swung beside the smoked alligator meat. Old Slewfoot had indeed done damage. Betsy the brood sow would have filled the room with her plump progeny by the coming fall. Jody hacked away a piece of alligator. The meat was dry but tender. He touched his tongue to it. Its saltiness was not unpleasing. He joined his father in the yard. At sight of the old muzzle-loading shotgun, Julia lifted her voice in a wail of delight. Rip shot from under the house to join her. Perk, the new feast, wagged his tail stupidly without understanding. Penny patted the dogs in turn. You'll likely not be so merry time the day be done, he told them. Jody boy, you best put on your shoes. It'll be rough going in places. It seemed to Jody that he would burst if there was further delay. He dashed into his room and routed out his heavy cowhide brogans, from under the bed. He slipped his feet into them and raced after his father as though the hunt would done, be done and over before he reached him. Old Julia was loping ahead, her long nose against the trail of the bear. The trail will not be too cold, Pa. Reckon he won't be gone too fur yonder to catch up with him? He'll be fur yonder, but we got a heap of better chance of catching up with him do we let him take it easy and give him time to lay up? A bear that knows he's followed moves a slot faster than one that figures the world's his own to prowl and feed in. The trail led south through the blackjacks. 
After the rain of the afternoon before, the great nub tracks made a plain pattern across the sand. He's got a foot like a Georgia nigger, Penny said. The blackjacks ended as though they had been sewn by hand, and there had been no more seed in the sack. The land was lower, and the growth was of large pines. Now I'm going to stop right here. Yes, I said the N-word. Yes, it's not appropriate. But yes, it is part of the story. So yes, I'm going to read it just the way it's read. Because this was the way people spoke in this time period. We're talking the 1920s and the 1930s in South, Southern America. Even in Florida is considered Southern. So please do not send me any ugly comments about the n-word it's just simply written there because this is the way people talk during this time period it's not meant as derogatory at all it's simply the way people talked so that's my editorial during this chapter four so now let's see the blackjacks ended as though they had been sewn by hand and there had been no more seed in the sack the land was lower and the growth was of large pines. Pa, how big you reckon he be? He's big. He ain't full weight right now, account of his stomach being shrunk up from laying up and empty. But look at that track. It's sizable enough to prove him. And look at the way it's deeper to back. A deer track will prove the same. A deer or a bear that's fat and heavy will sink in that away. A little low light doe or year. Yearling will, yearling will walk tippy-toe, and you'll not see more than the front of their hooves. Oh, he's big. You'll not be scared when we come up with him, Pa. Not less than things goes mighty wrong. I'm fearful always for the poor dogs. They're the scrappers gets the worst of it. Penny's eyes twinkle. I don't rest and reckon you'll be scared, son. Not me, he thought a moment. But if I was to be scared, I must I climb a tree? Penny chuckled. Yes, son, even if you ain't scared. It's a good place to watch the ruckus. They walked in silence. Old Julia moved, certainly. Rip the bulldog was content to follow at her heels, snuffing where she snuffed, stopping when she hesitated. She blew through her soft nose when the grasses tickled it. The feast made dashes, dashes to one side or other and once tore wildly after a rabbit that bolted from under his nose. Jody whistled after him. Leave him go, son, Penny told him. He'll join up again when it comes to him. He's lonesome. Okay, so I'm going to look up that word feast here. Hang on just a second. Since we're live, we can do this kind of thing. Because I've never seen that word feast before. And it has to do with the dog. Feast. Okay, feast dog. <clears throat> I do not find it in the dictionary. What do you think? Must be like a A pit bull or something. From the yearling. I don't know what feast is. It's one of the dogs, and he must be a little tiny dog. Who knows? 
Bye, Adanya. Thank you for coming by. Okay. Well, I don't know. We're going to have to... I'll have to research that word. F-I-E-C-E. -E. Feast. I don't know what it comes from. The feast. F-E-O. F-E-I-C-E. -E. Maybe I spelled it wrong. Hang on. F-E-I-C-E. -E. Well, it looks like other people are trying to figure out what it is. Okay, I'm going to try one more time. I'm putting in dog. Feisty. Okay, it's a feist dog. Um, it's a small hunting dog descended from terriers brought over to the United States by English miners and other working class men, uh, immigrants. This is from Wikipedia. Okay. These terriers probably included crosses between a fox terrier and a Manchester terrier and English white terrier. Okay, so it's a little terrier dog. That's what I thought it was. Little feist. But they call him feist. Feast, feist. I've been saying it wrong. Fit feist. All right, so now we got it. So uh, the feist made dashes to one side or another and once tore wildly after a rabbit that bolted from under his nose. Jody whistled after him. Leave him go, son, Penny told him. He'll join up again when it comes to him. He's lonesome. Old Julia gave a thin high wail and looked over her shoulder. The wise old scrapper's ch changing his direction, Penny said. Likely he's heading for the sawgrass ponds. If that's his notion, we can maybe slip her around and surprise him. Some understanding came to Jody of the secret of his father's hunting. The foresters, he thought, would have plunged after old Slewfoot the moment they had found his kill. They would have shouted and bellowed. Their pack of dogs would have bayed until the scrub echoed with it, for they encouraged them in it, and the wary old bear would have had a full warning of their coming. His father got game ten to their one. The little man was famous for it. Jody said, you sure can figure what a creature will do. You belong to figure. A wild creature's quicker than a man and a heap stronger. What's a man got that a bear ain't got? A mite more sense. He can't outrun a bear, but he's a sorry hunter if he can't outstudy it. The pines were becoming scattering. There was suddenly a strip of hammock land and a place of live oaks and scrub palmetto meadows. The undergrowth was thick, laced with cat briars. Then hammock two ended and to the south and west lay a broad open expanse that looked at first sight to be a meadow. This was the sawgrass. It grew knee deep in water. Its harsh saw saw-edged blades rising th so thickly that it seemed a compact vegetation. Old Julia splashed into it. The rippling of the water showed the pond. A gust of air across the open area. The sawgrass waved and parted in the shallow water of a dozen ponds showed clearly. Penny watched the hound intently. 
The treeless expanse seemed to Jody more stirring than the shadowy forest. At any moment, the great black form might rear itself high. He whispered, Will we cut around? Penny shook his head. He answered in a low voice, Wind's wrong. Don't seem to me like he's heading across it, no how. The hound splashed in a zigzag trail where solid ground edged the sawgrass. Here and there, the scent was lost in the water. Once, she dipped her head to lap, but not in thirst for the very taste of the trail. She moved confidently down the middle of the pond. Rip and Perk found their short legs too deep in muck for comfort. They retreated to higher ground and shook themselves, watching Julia anxiously. Perk barked shortly, and Penny slapped him for quiet. Jody stepped cautiously behind his father. A blue heron flew low over him without warning, and he started. <clears throat> the pond water was cold and instant against his legs. His breeches were clammy. The muck sucked at his shoes. Then the water was comfortable and it was good to walk in the wet coolness, leaving sandy whirlpools behind. He's feeding on the fire plant, Penny murmured. He pointed to the flat arrow-shaped leaves. Edges showed jagged tooth marks. Others were bitten clear of the stalk. It's his spring tonic. A bear will make for it first thing time he comes out in the spring. He leaned close and touched a leaf whose ragged edge was turning brown. Dogged if he weren't here and not a go too. That's how come him to have an appetite for a nip old poor Betsy, a poor old Batsy. The hound too paused. The scent lay that lay now, not underfoot, but on the reeds and grasses where the strong felt smelling fur had brushed. She laid her long nose against a bulrush and stared into space. Then, satisfied as to directions, flashed due south at a lively pace. Penny spoke now freely. He's done feeding. Old Julia says he's clipping it for home. He moved to higher land, keeping the hound in sight. He walked briskly, chatting. Many's the time I've seen a bear feeding on the fire plant in the moonlight. He'll snort and shuffle and splash and grunt. He'll rip them leaves off of them stems and cram them in his ugly old mouth like a person. Then he'll nose along and chaw like a dog chawing grass. And at the night birds crying over him and the bullfrogs hollering like nigger dogs and the mallards calling snake, snake, snake and the drops of water on the leaves of the fire plant shining bright and red as a bull's bull bat's eyes. It was as good as seeing it to hear Penny tell of it. I'd sure love to see a bear feeding on the fire plant, Pa. Well, you live long as me and you'll see that and a heap more things as strange and curious. Did you shoot them, Pa, while they was feeding? Son, I've helped my back my shot and contented myself with watching many a time when creatures was feeding harmless and innocent. It goes again me to crack down at such a time or when creatures is mating. Down again when it was a, was get meat or the Baxters go hungry, I've done what I've like I've no liking to do. And don't you grow up like the foresters killing meat you got no use for for the fun of it. That's evil as the bears, you hear me? Yes, sir. Old Julia gave a sharp cry. The trail cut at right angles to the east. I feared it, Penny said. The bay. The red bay thicket seemed impenetrable. This land of sudden changes gave good cover for the game. Old Slewfoot in his careless feeding had never been far from shelter. The bay saplings stood as close together as the palings of a stockade. Jody wondered how the bear had managed to work his bulk among them. But here and there as a sapling's thinned, or were young and limber, and he could see plainly marked a common trail. Other creatures had used it. Tracks crossed and crisscrossed. Wildcat had followed deer. Lynx had followed wildcat. And all about were the paw prints of the small things. Coons and rabbits and possums and skunks. 
feeding cautiously aside from the predatory kid. Penny said, I reckon I best load. He clucked to Julia to wait for him. She lay down knowingly to rest and Rip Perk dropped willingly beside her. Jody had been carrying the powder horn over his shoulder. Penny opened it and shook a measure of powder down the muzzle. From his shot bag, he pulled a wisp of dried black Spanish moss, inserted it for wadding, and packed it with the ramrod. He dropped in the measure of low mold shot, more waddling, and at the last, a cap, and used the ramrod lightly again. All right, Julia, get him. The morning's trailing had been a leisurely business, a pleasant jaunting rather than a hunt. Now the dark bay thicket closed in over their heads. Jories flew from the close denseness with an alarming whir of wings. The earth was soft and black, and there were scurryings and rustlings on either side in the bushes. On the trail, a bar of sunlight lay occasionally where the thick part, thicket parted. The scent, for all the comings and goings, was not confused, for the taint of bear hung heavy in the leafy tunnel. The short fur of the bulldog stood on end. Old Julia ran swiftly. Penny and Jody were forced to stoop to follow. Penny swung the muzzleloader, swung the muzzleloader in his right hand. Its barrel tipped at an angle so that if he stumbled and the charge went off, he would not touch the running dogs before him. A branch crashed behind and Jody clutched at his father's shirt. A squirrel ran chattering away. The thicket thinned. The ground dropped lower and became a swamp. The sunlight came through in patches as big as a basket. There were giant ferns here, taller than their heads. One lay crushed where the bear had moved across it. Its spice sweetness lay heavy on the warm air. A young tendril sprang back into upright position. Penny pointed to it. Slewfoot, Jody understood, had passed not many minutes before. Old Julia was feverish. The trail was food and drink. Her nose skimmed the damp ground. A scrub jay flew ahead, warning the game and crying, Pick up one! The swamp dipped a running branch to a running branch no broader than a fence post. The print of the nubbed foot spanned it. A water moccasin lifted a curious head, then spun downstream and smoothed out brown spirals. Across the branch, palmettos grew. The great track continued across the swamp. Jody noticed that the back of his father's shirt was wet. He touched his own sleeve. He was dripping. Suddenly, Julia bayed and Penny began to run. The creek, he shouted. He's trying to make the creek. Sound filled the swamp. Saplings crushed. The bear was a black hurricane mowing down obstructions. The dog barked. dogs barked and bayed. The roaring in Jody's ears was his heart pounding. A bamboo vine tripped him, and he sprawled and was on his feet again. Penny's short legs churned in front of him like paddles. Slewfoot would make it make Juniper Creek before the dogs could halt him at bay. A clear space opened at the creek's bank. Jody saw a black, a vast black shapeless form break through. Penny halted and lifted his gun. On the instant, a small brown missile hurled itself at the shaggy head. Old Julia caught up with her enemy. She leaped and retreated and in the moment of retreat was at him again. Rip darted in beside her. Slewfoot wheeled and slashed at him. Julia flashed at his flank. Penny held his fire. He could not shoot for the dogs. Old Slewfoot was suddenly deceptively indifferent. He seemed to stand baffled, slow and uncertain, weaving back and forth. He whined like a child whimpering. The dogs backed off an instant. The moment was perfect for a shot and Penny swung his gun to his shoulder, drew a bead on the left cheek, and pulled the trigger. A harmless pop sounded. He cocked the hammer again and pulled the trigger once more. The sweat stood out on his forehead. 
Again, the hammer clicked futilely. Then a black storm broke. It roared in on the dogs with incredible swiftness. White tusks and curved claws with streaks of lightning across it. It snarled and whirled and gnashed its teeth and slashed in every direction. The dogs were as quick. Julia made swift sorties from the rear. And when Slewfoot wheels rake at her, Rip leaped for the hairy throat. Jody was in a paralysis of horror. He saw that his father had cocked the hammer again and stood half crouching, licking his lips, fingering the trigger. Old Julia bored in at the bear's right flank. He wheeled not on her, but on the bulldog at his left. He caught him sidewise and sent him sprawling into the bushes. Again, Penny pulled the trigger. The explosion that followed had a sizzling sound, and Penny fell backward. The gun had backfired. Rip returned to his attempts for the bear's throat and Julia took up her worrying from the rear. The bear stood again at bay, weaving. Jody ran to his father. Penny was already on his feet. The right side of his face was black with powder. Slewfoot shook free of Rip, whirled to Julia and caught her into his chest with his cupped claws. She yelped sharply. Rip hurled himself at the back and buried his teeth in the hide. Jody screamed, he's killing Julia. Penny ran desperately into the heart of the fracas. He jammed the gun barrel into the bear's ribs. Even in her pain, Julia had taken a grip on the black throat above her. her Slewfoot snarled and turned suddenly and plunged down the bank of the creek and into the deep water. Both dogs kept their hold. Slewfoot swam madly. Only Julia's head showed above water below the bear's snout. Rip rode the broad back with bravado. Slewfoot made the far bank and scrambled up its side. Julia loosed her hold and dropped limply on the earth. The bear plunged toward the dense thicket. For a moment more, Rip stayed with him. Then, confused, he too dropped away and turned back uncertainly to the creek. He snuffed at Julia and sat down on his haunches and howled across the water. There was a crashing in the distant undergrowth, then silence. Penny called, Here, Rip. Here, Julia. Rip wagged his stumpy tail and did not stir. Penny lifted his hunting horn to his lips and blew, blew caressingly. Jody saw Julia lift her head, then fall back again, Penny said. I got to go fetch her. He slipped off his shoes and slid down the bank into the water. He struck out strongly. A few yards from shore, the current laid hold of him as though he were a log and shot him downstream in a, at a fierce clip. He struggled against it, fighting for distance. Jody saw him stagger to his feet far down the run, wipe the water from his eyes and push his way back up the shore to his dogs. He leaned to examine the hound and gathered her under one arm. This time, he went some distance upstream before taking to the creek. <clears throat> when he dropped into the water, stroking with his free arm, the current picked him up and deposited him almost at Jody's feet. Rip paddled behind him, landed, and shook himself. Penny laid the old hound down gently. She's bad hurt, he said. He took off his shirt and trussed the dog in it. He tied the sleeves together to make a sling and hoisted it on his back. This settles it, he said. I got to get me a new gun. The powder burn on his cheek had already turned into a blister. What's wrong, Pa? Near about everything. The hammer's loose on the cylinder. I know that. I've been having to cock it two or three times right along. But when it backfired, that belongs to me and the main strings. Springs got weak. Well, let's get going. You tote the blasted old moon. The procession started homeward through the swamp. Penny cut north and west. Now I'll not rest till I get that bear, he said. Just give me a new gun in time. Suddenly, Jody could not endure the sight of the limp bundle in front of him. There were tricklings of blood down his father's thin bare back. 
I want to go ahead, Pa. Penny turned and eyed him. Don't you go getting faintified on me. I can break a trail for you. All right, go ahead, Jody. Take the knapsack. Get you some bread. Eat a bite, boy. You'll feel better. Jody fumbled blindly in the sack and pulled out the parcel of pancakes. The briar berry jelly was tart and cool on his tongue. He was ashamed to have it taste so good. He bolted several of the cakes. He handed some to his father. Rations is mighty comforting, Penny said. A whine sounded in the bushes. A small cringing form was following them. It was Perp, the feist. Jody kicked him at it kicked at him in a fury. Don't bother him, Penny said. I suspected him all along. There's dogs as bear dogs, and there's dogs just ain't isn't bear dogs. The fast dropped in at the end of the line. Jody tried to break trail, but fallen trees lay thicker than his body and would not be stirred. Bullbriars tougher than his father's muscles snared him, and he could only push his way around them or crawl beneath. Penny, with his burden, had to shift for himself. The swamp was close and humid. Rip was panting. The pancakes lay soothingly in Jody's belly. He reached in the knapsack for the sweet potato pone. His father refused his share, and Jody divided it with Rip. The little feist, he thought, deserved nothing. It was good to clear the swamp at last and come into the open pine woods. Even the scrub that followed after for a mile or two seemed light and penetrable. Pushing through the low scrub oaks, the scrub palmettos, the gallberry bushes, and the titi was less laborious than crossing the swamp. It was late afternoon when the high pines of Baxter's Island showed ahead. The profession filed down the sand road from the east and into the clearing. Rip and Perk ran ahead to the hollow cypress watering trough kept for the chickens. Ma Baxter sat rocking on the narrow veranda, veranda, a mound of mending in her lap. A dead dog and no bear, eh? She called. Not dead yet. Get me water and rags and the big needle and thread. She rose quickly to help. Jody was always amazed at the capability of her great frame and hands when there was trouble. Penny laid old Julia down on the veranda floor. She whimpered. Jody bent to stroke her head and she bared her teeth at him. He trailed his mother disconsolately. She was tearing an old apron into strips. You can fetch the water, she told him, and he scurried to the kettle. Penny returned to the veranda with an armful of crocus sacks to make a bed for the hound. Ma Baxter brought the surgical equipment. Penny unwrapped the blood-soaked search shirt from the dog and bathed the deep gashes. Old Julia made no protest. She had known Claus before. He sewed the two deepest cuts and rubbed pine gum into all of them. She yelped once and then was silent as he worked. A rib, he said, was broken. He could do nothing for that, but if she lived, it would mend. She had lost much blood. Her breath came, breath came short. Penny gathered her up and bed, bed and all. Ma Baxter demanded, Now where are you carrying her? To the bedroom? I got to watch her tonight. Not to my bedroom, Ezra Baxter. I'll do for her what's got to be done, but I'll not have you popping in and out in the bed all night, waking me. I didn't have sleep last night. <clears throat> then I'll sleep with Jody and bed Julia there, he said. I'll not leave her alone in no shed tonight. Vexed me cold water, Jody. He carried her to Jody's room and laid her in the corner on the pile of sacking. She would not drink or could not, and he opened her mouth and poured water down her dry throat. Leave her rest now. We'll go do our chores. The clearing possessed this evening a strange coziness. Jody gathered the eggs from the haymow, milk the cow and turn the calf in to her and cut wood for his mother. Penny, as always, went to the sinkhole with a wooden ox yoke supporting two wooden buckets over his thin shoulders. Ma Baxter cooked supper poke greens and dried cow peas. She fried a frugal slice of the fresh pork. 
A piece of bear meat would go mighty good tonight, she lamented. <clears throat> Jody was hungry, but Penny had little appetite. He left the table twice to offer Julia food, which she rejected. Ma Baxter rose heavily to clear the table and wash the dishes. She asked for no details of the hunt. Jody longed to talk of it, to cast away the spell of tracking and the fight and the fear that had struck him. Penny was silent. No one noticed the boy and he dipped deeply into the dish of cowpeas. The sun set red and clear. Shadows lay long and black in the Baxter kitchen, Penny said. I'm wore out. I could do with bed. Jody's feet were raw and blistered from the cowhide shoes. Me too, he said. I'll set up a while, Small Baxter said. I ain't done much today. Excuse and fret and worry and mess with the sausage. Penny and Jody went to their room. They undressed on the side of the narrow bed. Now, if you was as big as your ma, Penny said, we couldn't lay in it without somebody fell on the floor. There was room enough for the two thin bony bodies. The red faded from the west and the room was dusky. The hound slept and whimpered in her sleep. The moon rose, an hour past the full, and the small room lay in a silver brightness. Jody's feet burned. His knees twitched. Penny said, You wakeful son, I can't stop walking. We went a fur piece. How you like bear hunting, boy? Well, he rubbed his knees. I like thinking about it. I know. I like the tracking and the trailing. I like seeing the saplings broken down, broke down in the ferns in the swamp. I know. I liked old Julia baying now and again. But the fighting's right fearsome, ain't it, son? It's mighty fearsome. It's sickening the dogs getting bloodied and sitch as that. And son, you ain't never seen a bear killed. But mean as they be, it's some way pitiful when they go down and the dogs tears their throats and they cry out just like a person and lay down and die before you. Father and son lay in silence. <clears throat> if the wild creatures only leave us be, Penny said. I wish we'd kill them all off, Jody said. Them that steals off on us and does us harm. Tain't stealing in a creature. A creature's got his living to make and he makes it the best way he can. Same as us. It's panther nature and wolf nature and bear nature to kill their meat. County lines is nothing to them, nor man's fences. How's a creature to know the land's mine and paid for? How's a bear to know I'm depending on my hogs for my own ration? All he knows is he's hungry. <clears throat> Jody lay staring into the brightness. Baxter's Island seemed to him a fortress ringed around with hunger. Now in the moonlight, eyes were shining, red and green and yellow. The hungry would dart into the clearing in swift forays and kill and eat and slink away again. Polecats and possums would raid the hen roost Wolf or panther might slay the calf before daylight. Old Slewfoot might come again to murder and feed. A creature's only doing same as me when I go hunting us meat, Penny said, hunting him where he lives and beds and raises his onions. It's a hard law, but it's a law. Kill or go hungry. Yet the clearing was safe. The creatures came, but they went again and went away again. Jody began to shiver and could not tell why. You cold, son? I reckon. He saw Slewfoot wheel and slash and snarl. He saw Julia leap and be caught and crushed and hold on, then fall away, broken and bleeding. But the clearing was safe. Move close, son, I'll warn you. He edged closer to his father's bones and sinews. Penny slipped an arm around him and he lay close against the length thigh. His father was the core of safety. His father swam the swift creek to fetch back his wounded dog. The clearing was safe and his father fought for it and for his own. A sense of snugness came over him. 
and he dropped to sleep. He awakened once, disturbed. Penny was crouched in the corner in the moonlight, ministering to the hell. And that's the end of chapters three and four. And I think that's all we're going to do for today. So until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Bye. I'm so glad, Bailey. Nice to see you, Bailey. Thanks for coming. And Denisha, good to see you. Y'all have any questions or want to know anything, you can email me at Ms. Tudor at gmail whoops at gmail dot gotta put the l in there dot com see you guys later have a good day bye